Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Robert and uh, his uh, mayor Feld for inviting me. I'm sorry, I don't speak French. I hope that he said some nice things about me. I don't know what he said. Um, but I'm uh, actually, this is the third time I come to Toulouse. Every time I come, it gets bigger and bigger. So uh, this must be something good going on, I guess. I don't know. Uh, anyways, um, actually, we'll not talk very much about the modeling issues uh, per se, but I wanted to actually go over this whole uh, sort of re research challenge of regional climate change. Um, this is pretty much the outline of my seminar. I will uh, hopefully spend about 10-15 minutes on each of these uh, topics. Um, I will first briefly, since I know that you are from different uh, disciplines, uh, give a very brief review of the processes of regional climate change and why it's so difficult to do a regional climate change prediction. Uh, go through the concepts of uh, climate change prediction. The, talk a little bit about the tools for uh, um, doing uh, regional climate change simulations. And then uh, go over some of the methods that have been developed uh, very recently uh, in order to do uh, um, climate predictions. And now uh, everybody is pretty much agreeing that this prediction should be done in a probabilistic uh, way. And uh, this is essentially the, the topic of my, of my seminar. Um, Robert has already sort of uh, <coughs> stole this slide from me, I guess, because he told you why it's so important to, uh, to uh, obtain regional climate change information, um, because uh, climate change can really, so this is my pointer, right? This, uh, okay, climate change can really um, affect a lot of different sectors of uh, uh, society and uh, natural ecosystems and so on. Uh, despite the fact that it's such an important issue, uh, if you go over the uh, first, second, and third the IPCC assessment report, uh, you will see very little information about regional climate change. Very general statements saying, uh, uh, you know, the high latitudes are going to warm more than the low latitudes and so on. Uh, very little information. And this has been a big issue with IPCC and with the scientific community. And uh, there is a very simple reason for that, because it's actually very, very difficult to, to do these uh, climate uh, projections or, or predictions at the regional scale. So. Let's first see what are sort of the basic processes of, uh, that affect regional climate change. First of all, I always like to start my presentations on this uh, from a slide like this, besides being a nice slide. Uh, it shows that really climate is not uh, just an atmospheric problem. We all know this, but sometimes we tend to forget it. But it's really a couple system pro uh, process uh, or problem in which we, you have components that are characterized by very different uh, spatial and temporal scales. Uh, you have uh, fast responding systems like the atmosphere and some asp aspects of the uh, chemosphere, and then you have very slow responding components uh, like the oceans, uh, the biosphere, uh, or the cryosphere. And of course, this determines a lot uh, how you approach the climate uh, prediction problem. So we should always remember that we are talking about a very complex and coupled uh, climate system. Now, when, you, when we talk about regional climate, we always have to start from the planetary and the large scale, because uh, the climate of Toulouse is really affected, to start with, by what happens uh, over the whole globe. You have a number of forcings that are sort of, uh, you know, global scale forcings, like the uh, input from the sun that uh, you know is not a constant, but actually changes slightly uh, over time, but uh, these changes are actually big enough to affect climate. Uh, Well-mixed greenhouse gases. I like this. Uh, this is all my greenhouse uh, effect slide. Uh, it's a nice cat, and uh, uh, I guess this is not me, but uh, okay. Um, as you know, this is pr the, the main problem that uh, we, are, we are sort of facing now uh, in the climate change uh, debate, the emission of um, gases like uh, CO2 and uh, um, methane or N2O that are, um, absorb the uh, infrared radiation emitted by the Earth by the Earth's surface and thus uh, warm the, um, the, the atmosphere. But then you have other large-scale uh, forcings that are very important, the continent ocean distribution. Uh, these affect, uh, you know, storm tracks and uh, large-scale dynamics, large topographical systems like the Himalayas, and the big volcanic eruptions in the history of the Earth. We all know there have been uh, major volcanic eruptions like Pinatubo that uh, can have uh, effects on the, on the global climate. And of course, if you affect the global climate, you also affect uh, features of the general circulation, like uh, storm tracks, 
uh, dynamics of the uh, ITCZ, the intertropical convergent zone, uh, planter way patterns, monsoon uh, modes of couple system like the NAO and El Nino. And this in turn affect our climate. For example, for, uh, for Europe, we all know that the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is really a global uh, atmospheric mode, uh, really affects the climate of, uh, of Europe. So the starting point of any uh, regional, you know, for anybody who studies regional climate change is really the planetary and the global scale. But then on top of these uh, planetary and global scale processes, you have some processes that act at a very local, uh, sort of regional and local scale. You have uh, forcings like topography, uh, complex topography like the Pyrenees, for example, um, land use distributions um, keep changing all the time, uh, coastlines, islands, these affect climate uh, locally. Uh, inland water bodies, lakes, uh, distribution of sea surface temperatures, anthropospheric aerosols. These can all affect several uh, dif different aspects of climate, uh, precipitation, surface energy, water budgets, and so on. So essentially, these local processes uh, modulate the climate change signal that comes from the large and the global scale. Uh, just a couple of examples of the um, of processes that act more at the regional scale, uh, something that I'm personally very interested in, and I know a lot of people in this audience are, are the aerosol effects. Um, atmospheric aerosols can affect the uh, um, radiative uh, uh, balance of the atmosphere through what are called direct effects, because they absorb and reflect solar ra radiation, or indirect effects, because they can act as uh, cloud condensation nuclei and then change the microphysical and the optical properties of clouds. By the way, feel free to interrupt me any time uh, if, you know, if you don't follow what, uh, what I'm saying. This is a very basic uh, lecture, by the way. Um, so aerosol is very important, especially at the regional scale, and I just wanted to give you an example. This is a, um, a picture that I took actually from an Italian news newspaper, uh, Repubblica, and uh, it shows a satellite picture. <coughs> this made actually the front page of Repubblica uh, of 17 November 2004, which is uh, about a week ago. Um, and shows this uh, huge cloud of, uh, uh, of uh, essentially smoke. This is China, this is Beijing up here, Tianjin and uh, the Yellow River. And it's amazing that uh, you have so much smoke uh, that you cannot even uh, see the, uh, the underlying continent. Uh, I was actually last week in New Delhi and uh, the, if any of you have been there, the, the pollution in New Delhi is really something incredible. I mean, you think you are in the middle of a cloud you actually you are, but you're in the middle of a, of a smoke cloud. So I, you would expect that something like this, such a smoke uh, cover, would have some climatic effects. And uh, in fact, if you look at the uh, temperature trend over China in the last 25 years, what you see here is the temperature difference uh, from observations uh, in the 30 years from 51 to 80, uh, sorry, 81, 98 minus 51 to 80. You see that uh, you know, in the northern regions of uh, Asia, and in the tropics, uh, you see this warming patterns, which is sort of consistent with the global warming we've been observing. But then over China, you see this actual cooling. And uh, there's been a lot of modeling studies and observational studies that have attributed this cooling to, uh, to essentially this, uh, this dust, uh, this smoke. Uh, so um, aerosols is typically a, 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 um, a regional scale uh, process that you need to be very aware of. Another one is topography. Uh, what you see here is a pretty standard uh, figure of precipitation over the US, but in Europe you would see something similar. You see um, this is mean annual precipitation for 30 years, but the point of this figure is to see how different it is between the Western United States, where you have very complicated topography, you have the Rockies, Sierra Nevada, mountain ranges, and so on, and the Eastern United States, Central Eastern, which is very flat. So you can see here that the regional topographical features are really very key to determining uh, local climate. Uh, and in particular, topography can affect the surface uh, water budget, in particular snow. This is a very important problem uh, within the climate change uh, debate uh, because, of course, if you warm the earth, you uh, also melt the snow, change the snow melt season, and so on. So mountain environments are going to probably be very, very um, uh, vulnerable uh, to climatic changes. So there are just two examples of the type of processes. I mean, on top of processes like uh, you know, global uh, forcings, uh, you know, internal modes of variability, then you have to see how these interact with regional forcings like uh, aerosols and like, and like topography. So you have this interaction across uh, spatial scales. 
And then you have integral interactions across temporal scales. You have a wide range of scales. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, essentially, you have here, OK, these are the uh, radiative forcing uh, due to different agents. In particular, these are greenhouse gases, and these are aerosols. Uh, this is radi radiative forcing. Greenhouse gases has, have generally positive radiative forcings, while aerosols have a negative radiative forcing because they reflect mostly uh, solar radiation. And, and this is the lifetime of these uh, forcing agents in the atmosphere. And greenhouse gases have very long lifetime, as you know, uh, decades to centuries, while aerosols have a very short lifetime. So uh, we are emitting both, you know, aerosols and uh, uh, greenhouse gases. But uh, what this is telling us is that um, we can decide what to do with aerosols, and, and uh, we can decide tomorrow to stop uh, emitting aerosols, and then the effects of these aerosols will actually disappear very quickly. But um, if you, you know, when we put in a molecule of CO2 into the atmosphere, this is going to hang into the atmosphere for many decades and centuries. So th their effects are going to be seen by our children and the children of our children. So we're really doing something now that will have very long-lasting uh, effects on one side, but on, a, on the other side, uh, sort of short-term effects. So you have a wide range. So this is mostly of a regional type, local regional type uh, process. And this is more of a global type process, but the two interact with each other very much. So the difficulty of, of regional climate change is because we are dealing with couple system processes across a wide range of temporal and spatial scales. Uh, processes that go from the planetary uh, scale to the regional scale. So we really... You know, globally, you can say you increase CO2, you expect the uh, Earth to, do, to, uh, to warm because you're changing in an obvious way. I mean, everybody believes that the uh, greenhouse effect exists. We have all evidence that it exists, so you expect a global warming. Uh, but what happens at the regional scale is very difficult because you have all these other processes that become important. So this is the underlying sort of physical mechanisms and physical problems that we have to think about. And then uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the concept of climate change prediction. Uh, anybody who's worked on uh, either weather prediction or any sort of prediction knows that uh, the basic concepts were set in the late 60s and uh, mid 70s by Ed Lorenz. Um, particularly in a paper in 75, um, he introduced uh, the concept of predictability of the first kind and of the second kind. The ability first kind of the first kind is essentially an initial value problem uh, in which we want to predict uh, pretty much sort of in a deterministic way uh, what is the evolution of the atmosphere or more generally of the climate system given some knowledge we have of the initial state. So this is essentially a weather prediction problem. This is what we do in numerical weather prediction. Since, however, we don't have a perfect knowledge of, initial, of the initial state, uh, this can also be approached in a probabilistic way, but essentially it's a deterministic problem. Um, and then uh, there is another issue, which is predictability of the second kind, which is essentially a boundary value problem. What we want to study there is not to know exactly how the system is going to, uh, to, uh, to evolve, uh, you know, one day today or 10 days or 10 years from now, but what we want to know is what is the response of the atmosphere or of the climate system, if we change the external forcings, so the, what we can call the boundary, the boundary uh, forcing. So let's say we increase CO2 or we change the solar input. How do the statistics of the climate change? We're not going to know exactly you know, what will happen at a certain time, but we want to know how the statistics, say precipitation average or standard deviation or something like that. So these are the concept of uh, predictability of the first kind and the second kind. Uh, once these have been uh, de uh, defined, you can also define a concept uh, called the predictability range or a range of predictability, which is essentially the time scale where you expect your system to be predictable. And this, of course, depends on the lifetime of the system. Uh, cumulus cloud evolve very rapidly, as you know, in the order of uh, maybe uh, hours or less. So you can expect to be able to predict, uh, to have any sort of predictability, at least of the first kind of the order of hours. Uh, synoptic systems, you go to order of days. Some synoptic systems, like blockings, are very stable. So you might think that once they are established, uh, the system becomes predictable on the order of weeks. And these, these are essentially atmospheric processes. Now, we said that the climate is really composed of different uh, components with different uh, temporal scales. When you start having uh, 
couple modes between the atmosphere and the, and the, uh, the oceans, like ENSO or, uh, or NAO, you also have the longer time scales involved in the ocean component. And so you might think that perhaps you can predict your system uh, at time scales of seasons to years. And there's a lot of research going on in this, uh, in this field. Anthropogenic climate change, is specifically, uh, at least in this uh, lecture, we're specifically interested in, uh, in the time scales of decades to centuries. So essentially, because we're interested in these time scales, there is essentially no hope to be able to predict how, uh, you know, how the climate will be on uh, 31st of uh, December of uh, 2075, because the system is chaotic and it's really impossible to do. But what uh, we essentially climate prediction is a uh, a uh, uh, particular problem of the second kind in the sense that we want to know how the climate system will respond. Uh, the climate system has defined by some climate statistics, say mean variability, extremes, and so on, to changing <coughs> anthropogenic forcings. And this is the standard view of climate change uh, research. However, uh, people are more and more realizing that there's also a first kind predictability component to, the climate to, to, this, to this problem because you have a couple system. Because you have the ocean, you have the cryosphere, and the biosphere. Uh, so you might think that because they evolve you know, the order of time scales of uh, decades to centuries to millennia even, uh, the initial state uh, of these components might actually affect uh, the evolution of climate. So in principle, you could have something like this. Let's say that this is an uh, unperturbed, uh, let's say we're talking global temperature or temperature over Toulouse or something, and this is an unperturbed uh, sort of climate state, pretty much at equilibrium in some ways. Um, and then we start including, uh, adding CO2 to the system. Uh, in principle, there is no reason not to expect that if we started two different positions in this, uh, in this uh, climate state, so two different initial conditions of ocean, of biosphere, of soil conditions, the two, even with the same forcing, might not evolve in different ways. Uh, for example, in this case, you have a system that reacts less, I mean, this example, the system is reacting less and with lower uh, variability. In this case, it's reacting more and with higher variability. So this already adds a, a, a one important element of uncertainty in doing climate change prediction, which is the uncertainty in the initial conditions. I think this was not very well recognized until maybe uh, five, six years ago, but uh, initial conditions may be important of the oceans and of the biosphere. And the, the main problem, the uncertainty that is introduced by this is that we actually don't know what the initial conditions were when we humans started the, well, we could call it the industrialization experiment. Let's say that we started putting in all the CO2 in, the, um, in 1860 or something like this. Um, we don't know really accurately how, what was the initial condition of the ocean, of the biosphere and the, and the cryosphere. So this adds an element of uncertainty um, to, to a possible prediction. There are many other elements of uncertainty. Um, one is the unpredictability of external forcings. Um, for example, climate is affected by, uh, as we said before, by uh, something usually referred to as natural forcings, like volcanic activity and solar activity. These are essentially unpredictable factors, as far as I know. I'm not an expert. I'm sure there is here somebody more expert than me on this. Uh, but as far as I know, we cannot predict when the next uh, big uh, Pinatubo eruption will be or how the solar activity is gonna change in the future. So I just wanna show this nice figure of uh, a volcanic eruption. Um, there's also an unpredictable, very strongly unpredictable component of the uh, uh, anthropogenic forcings because uh, there are scenarios out there, but really we don't know how you know, societies and our economy is really gonna develop uh, when we're gonna have technological advances. Um, I, you know, I think this is a kind of, a, nice little uh, example of this. This is the, uh, uh, a plot of energy consumption. Yeah, you can see it in China uh, since 1955 to 1995. And okay, everybody knows that um, you know, it's been increasing a lot in the last uh, 30 years, and this is why we're getting this cooling. But there's this uh, interesting blimp here around 1960, and uh, why was this? Because uh, in, for five years, I've been told by some Chinese people, um, <coughs> Chairman Mao essentially decided that China was going to uh, produce a lot of steel. So they had this big surge in the steel industry. And so the emissions went up, uh, I mean, for those days by a factor of two. So this is a totally unpredictable uh, uh, process. It's a small example, but it tells you how these things can happen because 
uh, you know, something uh, in the mind of somebody changes the course of, of history of the course of, of technology. So this is very important. The future forcings are actually have a very strong random and unpredictable component. Another uncertainty factor is the presence of thresholds in feedbacks. This adds non-linearity uh, to the system. And so every, every time you add non-linearity to any system, this becomes less predictable and more uncertain. Uh, there, there are a number of possible feedbacks. Um, there's no NCI's albedo feedback. Biogeochemical cycles uh, can uh, produce feedbacks. Uh, adaptation and mitigation can be considered as a human-induced uh, feedback uh, because climate affects humans, humans react and then mitigate the uh, causes of uh, climate uh, change and so this you can consider this as a feedback. Uh, and then threshold behav behaviors also enhance the non-linearity and decrease, and decrease the predictability. Uh, for example, a typical example of the shutdown of the thermohaline circulation, that's something that can occur and a lot of people think has occurred. Uh, quite abruptly, or the melting of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. And I wanted to show this um, in terms of thresholds and feedbacks, but oops, what is today considered to be one of the uh, main uh, sort of uh, new problems, at least as far as I'm concerned. What you see here is, uh, and these are essentially the sea ice feedbacks. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if you, this is a, the Larsen B ice shelf, which is, which is located in Western Antarctica. And what happened in 2002 is that this is the way sort of the ice shelf looked like, well, not exactly like this, but in 2002 there was a, uh, if I can start this thing again, yes, there was an, a very rapid and uh, a very extended uh, collapse of this ice sheet that's from something like this. If you actually look at it now, it looks something like this. Uh, so uh, this was totally unexpected, especially the time scales of what, what happened here was totally unexpected. Um, so that people are now rethinking totally the, uh, at least to my knowledge from what I heard, they're rethinking the ice dynamics. And this actually adds a big component of uncertainty to the climate change uh, debate because things like the melting of the Greenland ice sheet uh, or, or the Antarctic ice sheet were considered to be problems of really long times. Um, and now, the, you know, I was at this IPCC meeting uh, a few weeks ago, uh, this concept really changed. Now people are starting to think that it is, you know, with sufficient forcing, it is actually possible to produce within the next century significant melting of the, of the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, which means that when we're talking about sea level change, we're not talking anymore uh, about, you know, uh, 10 centimeters to one meters, but we are really talking about a significant, uh, let's say, not negligible probability or possibility that uh, we could have uh, you know, significant melting of West Antarctic ice sheet and so three to six meters of uh, sea level change, which will totally change the, uh, the, perce no, I mean the perception, the, the whole debate of, of impacts. Anyway, this is, this is again an example of, uh, of, uh, of the feedbacks that add the, um, add, uh, reduce predictability and <coughs> add uncertainty. Another exempt is, um, is the presence of regimes. Uh, you know that in our atmosphere, um, there is, uh, at least there is evidence that there are quasi-stationary regimes of, cir of circulation. What does it mean? That the global circulation likes to reside in specific configurations more than in others. It's more stable in this configuration, and then migrates from one to the other in a sort of chaotic ways. Um, sometimes because you give it a little kick, sometimes just <coughs> because of internal variability. And what can happen is that the external, oh, these are essentially, um, unpredictable events when you move from one sort of attractor to another. And uh, what can happen is that the external forcings can actually modify the frequency of occurrence of different regimes. And I'd like to show this uh, very nice example from this paper by Corti et al. 99. What you see here in this, essentially these plots are um, plots of uh, frequency, um, are PDFs, so two-dimensional PDFs, frequency of residence of the northern hemisphere uh, 500 millibar geopotential height uh, in, uh, in this, in this uh, phase space. These are just some indicators. So think about it as, uh, just read this in this way, that when you look at 49 to 94, there are four, uh, let's call them attractors, but uh, four stable regimes that the atmosphere likes to reside, uh, at least in the ANSA pre-analysis, uh, that uh, Cortier are called A, B, C, D. Uh, they found the same things when they took out El Nino and La Nina uh, years. So these are actually, 
not uh, related to uh, sort of particular modes, but they're actually sort of internal uh, behaviors of the atmosphere. Then they looked at the uh, period 4971 and the period 7194. You know that uh, the mid 70s are sort of considered to be a uh, sort of threshold point where we actually started to see a big change in the, in the, in the climate system. If you look at the IPCC, for example, temperature increase, you will see that uh, you have a big increase in the 30s. Then you have this flattening out until about the mid, uh, the early 70s, and then you have the big jump. So a lot of people think that really the, the anthropogenic signature occurred uh, since, since the 70s on. So you can consider this as a human, uh, okay, uh, without entering too much into this discussion, but let's think of it as a human uh, affected uh, period, 7194, and a uh, not human affected period. And what you see here is that you still have the original uh, attractors, you know, C, these are C and D, and these are I and B. But what has happened is that in the last uh, 20 years, the atmosphere uh, prefer to reside in the attractors A and B rather than the attractors C and D. So what if we think that what is causing this has been the human influence, what has happened here is that uh, the humans have actually uh, modified uh, the, uh, the frequency that the atmosphere like to reside in different attractors. And this is a highly nonlinear process, so very, very uncertain. Another example I'd like to give is this one that um, uh, actually Jonathan uh, Overpeck gave me very kindly. This is a 2,000-year um, uh, sequence of uh, um, um, sort of some drought um, uh, indicators over this uh, region of the central U.S. And you see that in the first uh, 1,200 years of this, uh, of this uh, record, you have a lot of currents of this, uh, what are called the mega droughts. They can last uh, about 100 years and so. And then about this time, you see that there's a big shift in the sort of hydrologic, reg hydrologic regime of, uh, of this region. So what, what one might think is that here you have entered sort of in a new, uh, in a new type of regime. Or what, okay, of course, in this case, it's not due to anthropogenic forcings, but uh, maybe some other external forcings uh, or maybe just internal variability has caused this abrupt shift from one regime to, to another one. But this is just to say that you have this nonlinear um, uh, uh, sort of processes that are also essentially unpredictable or very little predictable. So the end result of all this is that the, the you know, climate is, uh, is uh, characterized by um, a, a uh <coughs> very high level of uh, internal variability, um, which is essentially a random variability. Uh, you see here some examples of uh, reconstructions. And so this really affects the climate prediction problem because uh, if we have this, uh, this uh, high internal variability and no lin linearity in the system, um, we have uncertainty in the initial conditions. We don't know what really the initial conditions were in the oceans uh, and so on. We have essentially random components in the external forcings. We don't know if we're going to have big volcanoes, or if how really uh, human society are going to change. Uh, we really have a number of possible uh, futures, and the, the each of these possible futures is going to be characterized by a certain probability, and only one of these futures will actually happen. And uh, this is sort of uh, uh, projected here. You can think of this as a uh, PDF of possible future. Let's say this is global temperature change. And uh, this are actual climate change PDF. This has nothing to do with what we use to, uh, to make a prediction. Future climate can go in uh, any of these, uh, of these states. In this particular case, I'm hypothesizing we have two modes, you know, a more probable one and a less probable one. Um, because maybe, I don't know, we have a major war or something, so we stop producing CO2, so we may end up here or whatever. And then eventually the actual climate change will be somewhere in this PDF. Um, the width of this PDF, uh, is what we can refer to as uncertainty. Now, in this case, this is an intrinsic uncertainty. Uh, and usually the word uncertainty has a bad connotation, especially in the media. You go, you know, or in the stakeholders. In this case, stakeholders like to not to have uncertainty. But in this case, this is actually a good uncertainty because this uncertainty is telling us, which are the uncertainty I'm calling intrinsic uncertainty, is telling us what are the possible states that the climate system may have in the future. And we want to know as wide as possible. Uh, I mean, we want to know the full range of these states and what is the probabilities. So the higher this uncertainty in principle, the better it is. I remember having this, um, I really changed a lot my, uh, my view of uncertainty uh, in the last couple of years after talking to the impact people. 
because I always thought, uh, you know, we climate modelers should decrease uncertainty. And then uh, there was this talk by a very famous impact modeler, and uh, he said that he, want, he wanted very high uncertainty because he wanted to know what are all the possible states in the future, even th if there are very low probability but high uh, impact events, because uh, they want to calculate what, what are the risks associated with these events. So the intrinsic uncertainty is actually a good uncertainty. And it's essentially impossible to predict where the actual climate change is, because this is determined by a lot of random uh, and nonlinear factors that are unpredictable. So this really, at least in my eyes, um, uh, changes what I at least thought five, six years ago, the, the issue of climate prediction. Um, and I think it's not to predict what will be the, uh, the, you know, the climate of the future, but it's really to try to reconstruct as closely as possible, the PDF of future climates. In other words, this, the purpose of climate prediction is not to try to catch this, uh, this uh, bar here, which I think is essentially impossible, but it's really to try to reproduce the actual PDF of possible future climates. Now, let's say we use uh, models and so on to do this, and then we come up with the PDF of future climates. We may find something like this. No, nobody's perfect, so we are not able to reproduce the full PDF. Now, Again, the width of this distribution is different from the width of this one, which means that we are adding uncertainty to the intrinsic uncertainty of, of, the, of the climate system. Now, this is bad uncertainty because the uncertainty we add is due to the fact that we don't know the system well, we don't know the processes, that our models are not perfect. So what really a climate model should do is to try to reduce this uncertainty that we're adding with the prediction, but not this one, which is the intrinsic uncertainty of the climate system. Um, so having sort of decided this, that the, what is the purpose of climate prediction, at least uh, in, my, in my view, and what is good uncertainty and bad uncertainty, uh, very quickly, why is regional climate prediction more difficult than global climate prediction? And um, um, essentially, the reason is that regional climates are much more nonlinear and much more highly variable than global climates. Uh, because the natural modes of variability affect regional climates more. For example, you know, El Nino globally may not be very important, uh, but at the regional scale may really affect climate, the same for the NAO and so on. And because you have higher variability, it's also more difficult to actually detect climate changes. This is an interesting um, um, uh, slide that I received from Susan Solomon. Uh, what you see here is the global uh, temperature uh, change, surface temperature uh, trend uh, since 1870 on, and you have, okay, this is in Fahrenheit because they still use this strange uh, um, measuring system, uh, but anyway, um, uh, they have a trend, and they have a fairly high R square, 0 0.595, if you actually look at the global scale. When they look at the U.S. national scale, the trend is even higher, but the R square is really much lower. Why? Because you have much higher variability. When you look at the local scale, uh, you do have significant trends, but the R square is essentially uh, close to zero. So you have this, at the regional scale, we really, you really have uh, very high variability, and so it's very difficult to actually detect and attribute um, uh, climate change signals. Uh, let me also show you at the interdecadal time scale this effect of variability. What you see here is uh, global climate changes predicted by five GCMs. This is precipitation change and temperature change. Uh, these are five GCMs. Uh, this is 1960 to 2100 uh, under the A2 and B2 scenarios. And you see pretty standard things. So, okay, you see that the warming, uh, you know, in case of B2 is kind of linear, in this case it's pretty smooth. And if you increase temperature, you increase evaporation, so you generally increase precipitation. So everything looks pretty smooth and nice. When you go at the regional scale, for example, this is precipitation change. Uh, this is over East Africa for the uh, short rainy season, OND, or October, November, December and temperature change. This precipitation change for the monsoon, for East Asia monsoon. And you see here a lot of variability. You see uh, this uh, sort of multi-decadal uh, regimes uh, and so on that are underlined. You don't see anything that is as smooth as, as this curve. So it's very difficult to actually, and these are essentially nonlinear, if you, if you wish, uh, random processes. There's no reason why this particular uh, regime should be occurring in the 2040s to 60s or in the 2020s or something like that. Uh, in this case, you see, I think, something very interesting that uh, you have this sort of threshold type of, of behavior. Nothing happens until about 2040. And then all these five models are getting this uh, big increase in monsoon rain um, 
for the second half of the century. So this is also a sort of a nonlinear um, threshold behavior that does not happen at the global scale or for temperature. If you are curious about the Mediterranean, this is what most models are actually showing. For summer, uh, uh, JJA, this is actually shown by the vast majority of models, you see a decrease in precipitation. In this case, it's uh, quite consistent across models, except for this one, which is, which is an old version of GFDL model. Uh, if you look at the winter, you see that we are all over the place. But an um, interesting thing of this is that if you go back here, and let's say I want to look at climate change around the 2060s, okay, and I use only one model, and the model happens to be the CSI raw model, and then I look and see that you see an increase of 25% precipitation for these uh, two decades. Then I might think, oh, okay, this is a long-term trend. In reality, it is not, because this was just interdicated variability. So at the regional scale, your, your climate changes for any period you do really have to be interpreted in a broader context of how you actually get to that climate change uh, process. At the global scale, everything, are, things are kind of, if not linear, they're pretty smooth. So you can think you're following paths like this path number one. But at the regional scale, you can have something with a lot of variability before you actually get to the period you're interested on or you can get nothing for a long time and then a big, a big jump or something like this. And when you actually go and calculate impacts, I think it makes a big difference whether uh, you know, I get an increase in 20% in precipitation, but if the previous uh, 30 years had been very dry or had been normal, I think it makes a big difference. So when you talk about regional climate change, you really have to worry a lot about the path that you obtain to, uh, to get a, a, point, a, a certain level of climate change. Um, the other issue why it's so difficult to do regional uh, change prediction is that, as we have seen, there are a lot of large uh, sort of um, wide uh, scale of uh, forcing a processes we need to, to model. And our models really, at least the basic models we use to do climate, uh, climate simulations, are not adequate to resolve those processes. This leads to the, uh, the third portion of my talk. Uh, as you know, a couple of GCMs are used to uh, do climate change projections, and these GCMs have really evolved a lot in the last uh, in the last decades. We are here where GCMs include atmosphere, land surface, coupled ocean. Most GCMs include uh, aerosols, and some GCMs are now including carbon cycle. The problem with GCMs, of course, is resolution. Uh, current couple models, I'm talking about couple models here, not atmospheric models are still run a sort of 100 to 300 kilometer scale. This is the way Europe looks at that scale. So, uh, okay, France is there, but uh, in fact, my hometown has disappeared from this uh, particular uh, model. Uh, so excited about this. I cannot go to the mayor of my hometown and say, this is how climate is gonna change there. So a number of techniques have been developed uh, to sort of refine the, um, the uh, um, sort of the regional information. I'm not gonna go through all this. All I wanna say is that uh, there are many techniques that are today available. One is uh, the use of, for example, variable resolution models, which is in fact the, uh, the French, uh, uh, you know, Michel Deque and uh, collaborators have been pioneering this uh, and have liked this approach for a long time. I've personally worked on uh, the use of regional climate models, which essentially using a limited area model uh, that is run at the lateral boundaries by uh, global model fields. Um, but then you can use statistical downscaling, uh, you can use high resolution time slice experiments, or you can use a combination of all these techniques, which is what being done in a European project called uh, Prudence. So there are techniques today, they, they, I don't wanna go into all this, but they, all I'm saying is that there are techniques where you can get this broad scale uh, sort of model output and make fine scale um, uh, regional, uh, regional information that accounts for the local processes. And a little bit advertising that uh, ICTP, we actually have a regional model that we've developed over the years and we use for a wide variety of applications. Uh, so having said that, let's uh, go on how to, how, to, uh, how to actually do this. Uh, having decided that the way to approach climate prediction is the probabilistic way to try to reproduce this PDF of future climate, how do we do this? The first thing is to uh, get a grasp of uncertainty and also get a grasp of reliability because um, one problem with climate, pr with, with climate uh, uh, prediction is that really we cannot verify it. We can, I mean, weather prediction has uh, improved a lot in the last years because you know, every day you have a verification process. If your model is bad, you change it and you make it better. Seasonal prediction is improving also because of that. You have a smaller sample, but you still have enough seasons that you can improve your model. 
in climate you don't have you cannot do that you you cannot verify your climate prediction essentially because by the time we get there the information is not needed anymore so how how do we assess whether a model is reliable or not whether the projection is reliable or not so the first thing is to get a grasp of uncertainties and there is a long uh, cascade of uncertainties that goes from the socioeconomic assumptions that lead to, uh, to the emission scenarios and that lead to the concentration uh, scenarios and these are uncertainties that are quite large um, uh, you know, these are the emission scenario uncertainties in the IPCC uh, set of scenarios that result in this uh, sort of uh, uncertainty in concentrations. And uh, we are talking here going from like 500 to uh, 1,000 ppm by uh, the year 2100. So it's a wide range of uncertainty. So if we want to build a PDF, we have to somewhat account for this wide range of uncertainties in these first sort of three steps. Um, what I'm more interested in uh, is, is the sort of the uncertainty related to the climate simulation segment of this cascade, which is essentially <coughs> this segment. You know, once we have concentration, we use global climate models to see the response of the global circulation. And then we may want to use uh, regionalization techniques to get uh, at uh, regional climate change. And this has a lot of uncertainties uh, involved with that in, uh, in global modeling. Um, First of all, these models are uh, sensitive to initial conditions. It's usually referred to internal model variability, but perhaps the biggest source of uncertainty is what is usually referred to as model configuration uncertainty. And this essentially means that if you run two different models or two different configurations of the same models, say using two different convection schemes, you can get very different results. This is an example from the TAR. Uh, temperature change, global, this is even at the global scale. Nine models, you can get for the same uh, scenario so the same amount of uh, uh, greenhouse gases, either one and a half or uh, five degrees change. Uh, you go to the regional scale, we looked at like 22 regions, uh, and this is what you find for temperature. You look, for example, regions, especially in the high latitudes where the CI's feedback effect is strong. So this is North Asia. So essentially this region here, uh, Northern Europe. So this region. Uh, you know, Alaska, Greenland, and so on. This is uh, a DJF uh, precipitation change between uh, uh, A2 scenario and uh, present day climate. And all I want you to look at are these two dotted lines. These are, this is the range of the, of the different nine models. And one model is telling us that, uh, uh, let's see, Northern Europe is gonna warm by uh, two degrees in the winter. Another model is, gonna is telling us that it's gonna warm by 13 degrees. Um, so this is a huge range. Um, so how do we know, you know how, do we, how do we actually use this information? If you go to precipitation, of course, it's even worse because the models don't even agree, usually don't even agree on the sign. And when you down, downscale, this is an example of what happens. This is a GCM simulation of precipitation change under some A2 scenarios. It doesn't really matter what, uh, and you see this is mostly increase everywhere. These are actually minus and minus. So from yellow on is decrease. Uh, so you have an increase in most of Europe. This is France, Toulouse is around here somewhere. And a decrease over you know, the uh, northeastern Europe. Then when you run your regional model, you see that what the uh, finer resolution of the mountains is doing is actually changing a lot, this, the signal at the regional scale. This is these uh, regions of the Alp, and all of a sudden what was a positive signal becomes a negative signal, negative precipitation signal, the same of the Pyrenees. I think Toulouse is somewhere here, right? And, uh, so if you're actually interested in climate change over Toulouse and only look at the GCM, you think you're getting increased precipitation. Then you run your regional model, which supposedly captures your uh, topogra local topographic effects better, and you change the sign. So you see a big source of uncertainty due to the, due to the models. Um, and then reliability. Um, we could talk about this a long time, but I don't have time at the moment. But it li there are several criteria that you can use to say, I trust one model more or less than another. One is, of course, uh, you look at the model, uh, how the model reproduces present day climate. Uh, this has been used a lot. Usually, uh, you know, people say, okay, if my model does not reproduce, uh, has a big bias and the change is less than the bias, then I don't trust the changes, things like that. This is actually, a, in some ways, a misleading criterion because um, how do you really judge whether a model is good or not? Uh, let's say that we're interested in climate change over, uh, over uh, Europe, and you have a model that does perfect in, in simulating precipitation over Europe, but it's really uh, lousy everywhere else. 
and we have another model that is really good everywhere else but not so good over Europe, uh, which one is really better? The model that is globally good or the model that is good over your region? Uh, it's very difficult. Um, also, a lot of models are tuned. A lot of parameters are actually tuned to reproduce uh, very good present-day conditions. But these parameters, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you double CO2 and they go all over the place. So uh, this is a criteria that a lot of people use, but it's very, um, very dangerous, I think. Another one is the intermodal agreement in the simulation of climate change. People think, okay, if I, if I have nine models, you go back here, for example, this is precipitation change DJF. I have nine models, they're all telling me the precipitation is increasing over the Mediterranean or decreasing. Then I tend to trust this, uh, this answer better than in another region where like here, this is southern Australia, uh, where the models are all over the place. This is also kind of uh, dangerous because, um, okay, all the models might be telling you the same story because they're all similar to each other and they're all wrong. So all of these have to be taken with a grain of salt. Another one is the model performance in reproducing uh, known climates different from present, like paleoclimates. People are starting to do that. You think if a model can reproduce a... Uh, climate conditions that are very different from present, then I have more trust that I can do climates that are different from present day climate. Um, but at the end, after you include all of these together, uh, you really, I think the, the, an important point is that you have to understand what the model is trying to tell you. you the change that the model is telling you is occurring over Europe, for example. Uh, the best way to be confident in that change is that you, under, you understand the underlying physical process. So there's, there's a big push in the latest IPCC to, to go in this direction, not to just look accurately at model output, but to try to understand what, uh, what is really the underlying physical process. For example, other models are telling us that the Mediterranean is going to dry in the summer, visually, I would say 90% of the models, so it seems to be a very robust signal. But why that is happening, uh, that's still an active I item of debate. Um, but, I mean, since it's so difficult to say one model is better than another, and since all the models are all over the place, and since we have uh, big uncertainty in the scenarios and big uncertainty in the concentration, really the only way to approach the issue of uh, probabilistic prediction of climate change is to use the compounded information, either from different models or from uh, maybe the same models, but run in many different uh, configurations. And this is really what uh, what everybody is doing, I mean, all the major centers uh, are doing uh, right now. Nobody really looks at individual models anymore. Okay, people do, and you can do that and have some uh, treat that as a sensitivity experiment or so on. But if you really want to do, a, want to provide the stakeholders, the users, some useful information about climate change, really this, this I think, needs to be, first of all, approached in a probabilistic way. So try to reproduce the PDF of future climate changes, or it needs to be and it needs to be compounded information from all the tools that we have that we have uh, available at the moment. In the last uh, five minutes, seven minutes, I just wanted to uh, tell you what are some different approaches that are being followed at the moment. Traditionally, what the TAR has done is simply uh, the message of the TAR has been uh, the, the range of uh, sort of uh, temperature change prediction by 2100 is 1.4 to 5.8. We don't assign any probability to that. We think they're all equally plausible, which to me, okay, I'm not a statistician, but to me it means they're all equally uh, probable, I guess. Um, so essentially IPCC is using, is telling us that we have a flat distribution of future PDF, uh, which includes all the uncertainties. And these are uncertain in the models, in the uh, scenarios, and so on. So this is all of the old school uh, approach. I think the next IPCC will have to step away from this and be more um, more specific about assigning some probability to uh, to this to these outcomes, because if the IPCC doesn't do, doesn't do it, then somebody else will, and uh, and this will not be very good. Already now, I hear people say, "Oh, I think you know, B2 is more realistic than A2 because uh, B2 is more in the middle of the range." But this doesn't really it's not really a good reason to think it's more realistic. Uh, the first step away from this uh, sort of flat probability assumption was taken by, uh, in this paper by Wigler and Raper, 2001. Um, to my knowledge, this was the first paper that produced some probabilities, PDFs of a future climate change. And this is a figure taken from that paper. This is sort of global temperature change, 2030, 2070, 2100. 
what they did in this case, they actually used a simple climate model. A simple climate model is a couple model. Uh, it's not a full GCM, uh, the atmospheric component, maybe it's a two-dimensional very coarse resolution component. Um, <coughs> and then it's coupled with a simple uh, ocean box model, uh, it's a simple uh, carbon cycle and so on. So being so simple, uh, it's very simple, but you can actually tune some key parameters to reproduce the global response of full-blown GCMs. So it's a useful tool to actually look at uh, global mean temperature change. Because it's so simple, you can run it you know, on a PC for a million type of simulations. So essentially all they did was to take a simple climate model, run uh, zillions of uh, uh, configuration of the parameters they have in the model, like the air uh, exchange and so on. They run uh, zillions of simulations of uh, scenarios. They assigned probability to each scenario. Essentially, they assigned a flat probability to each of the emission scenarios. Um, so by doing all this, they literally created uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of simulations. So they uh, produced uh, PDFs based on those. Which, which are the ones that you see here. So this is an approach using simple model. Now people are using uh, what are called the intermediate complexity models. There's something uh, in between these and fully coupled model. To just by brute force run uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of simulations and produce PDFs. But of course, this can tell you what may happen at the global scale, but at the regional scale really does not help you very much. Um, you can use either simple models. Uh, Webster et al., the group at MIT, is actually doing this by using uh, what are called integrated assessment models, in which instead of assuming scenarios and probabilities to scenarios, they actually incorporate the human component uh, within, this, uh, within their sort of simple uh, climate models. So this is another area of active research that I think will, will really improve in the future. Um, another approach is to use that is being taken by the Harley Center. And uh, there are at least two papers that have dealt with this. I think there are actually more. Um, essentially, um, um, what they do here, they use the Hadley model. But what they do is they actually change the physics. Besides doing different scenarios, they change the physics parameterization within the model. So let's say they have a uh, cumulus cloud scheme. The cumulus cloud scheme will have something called the precipitation efficiency parameter or something called the vertical uh, um, exchange parameter or something like this. And uh, I mean, if any of you have done this type of modeling, know th that uh, you know, okay, you can choose a vi parameter value because you like it in the test case. Then you use it in the other test case; it doesn't work very well. So, these parameter values have a range of being realistic, but uh, at the same time, you don't know what the real value is. So, essentially, what they did: they sampled, they created this big matrix of parameters within their model, and they started sampling within this matrix. Of course, this was a matrix like. Uh, 20 by 20 parameters, so you cannot run a couple model uh, for all those uh, for all those parameters. So they ran sort of essentially the perimeter of this matrix, and then they used this um, sort of scaling assumption. They assumed that uh, each parameter, the effect of each parameter, was linearly scaling, and in this way they sort of artificially uh, filled up their matrix, and essentially they increased their ensemble sides. Uh, by using this sort of scaling assumption. And by doing that, they came up with this uh, sort of um, uh, PDA, this PDF of future climate. Uh, in particular, this paper came out uh, in Nature very uh, recently, and they uh, created some PDFs of, uh, of uh, climate sensitivity parameters. So this is the se okay, the first one is uh, use simple models. The th second one is use a global model, artificially, let's say, enhancing the ensemble size using some tricks. Uh, the third approach, of course, is uh, not to do anything like this. Um, I mean, not to do anything artificial, but just try to use the information that is coming from all available um, uh, simulations. And uh, there are a number of papers uh, that are actually been com coming out um, that have actually looked at regional climate change. Um, essentially, in these papers, what is being done um, uh, one was a method that uh, I developed with Linda Mearns uh, in these papers 2002-2003 that I call Reliability Ensemble Averaging Method. What we do is to calculate the probability that a change is above a certain threshold. Let's say that a temperature change is uh, in a certain scenario, in a certain range of scenarios, is above like 3 degrees or something like that. And you do that by getting results from uh, all the different models that you have available. And then you can do it in two ways. Reisner and Palmer did it very simply. They do what they do in seasonal prediction. They say, okay, my threshold is three and a half degrees. I have 17 models. 
And uh, you know, five models uh, tell me they have more than 3.5 degrees. And the rest tells me I have less. So the probability of getting more is 5 over 17. Um, so that's one way to do it. Uh, the way that we do it is something similar but a little bit refined. What we do is we weight each model uh, by something that we call the reliability factor. Uh, and we calculate our rel reliability factor uh, based on some of the criteria that, I, that we talked about before. And then uh, by using different, uh, um, a bunch of uh, different models, I think in this case we used nine, uh, we came up with this, uh, these are uh, essentially, they're not PDFs, they're um, cumulative PDFs or inverse cumulative PDFs of climate change over, for example, in over all these different regions uh, for temperature for the two scenarios, DJF, being above certain <coughs> thresholds. So for example, over this particular region, uh, we're saying there's no probabil zero probability that the change would be above four degrees or, or something like that. So this is, you can actually invert this and, f and get PDF. So this is another type of approach where you just try to use the information from the models you have without doing any massaging of the output. And uh, very recently, Tebaldi et al. developed a more Bayesian uh, approach to, to doing this, which I'm not very familiar with, but it's a paper that is in, I think will come up, uh, will, will come out very, very, uh, very soon. Uh, so it, there at least uh, you see there is a lot of research going in that direction. There are several uh, methods doing. So this goes to the end of my talk. Uh, so let me conclude by saying that, uh, first of all, we have to recognize, I think Richie says very much, that in the climate change prediction, there are two types of uncertainty. One is an intrinsic uncertainty of the climate system. And, and uh, you know, I call it a good uncertainty, but maybe it's not good, I don't know. But it's an uncertainty that we don't want to reduce. We actually want to characterize in the fullest possible way because we want to tell the stakeholders, we want to tell the users what are all the possibilities uh, of possible climate changes, even the most remote ones, especially if they can have a high, high impact. And then there is an unwanted uncertainty, an uncertainty due to the fact that to the prediction process itself, because we don't know the system and our models are not, uh, are not very reliable and not perfect. And that's the one that we really want to reduce. In this sense, I think the, the problem is uh, this problem of climate sensitivity, you know, the essentially the response of uh, global models to increasing um, uh, CO2 concentration. Um, these models are still, this, this range of climate sensitivity is still very large and people think that's one of the problems, one of the key uncertainties that needs to be reduced. Uh, and then because of the nature of the climate prediction uh, problem, because there's some, so many, so much random component to it, really this problem needs to be approached in a probabilistic way. So what we should try to give the, the stakeholders are not answers like uh, climate is going to change like this. Climate in the, 20, you know, the three decades of 21st century is going to be like this. But the, we should give them uh, PDFs of possible changes that they can use to, uh, to, uh, to, to produce, to do risk analysis and, and impact analysis. And this, this is being most more and more recognized in the last uh, few years. And essentially, in the, uh, until the third IPCC assessment report, there was nothing about this, nothing about PDFs of future climate. But in the next report, we'll see much, much more. Um, now, my own personal feeling is that you can uh, play tricks with the models, uh, make assumptions about uh, scalability and so on, but especially if you go at the regional scale. Uh, I think it's very, very dangerous to do that. And the only way to produce PDFs, I think, is to make li to use large ensembles of simulations in which you try to cover fully cover the phase space of the of the future climate uh, change. Um, the space, okay, the future climate change phase space. So you need large ensembles of simulations with different initial conditions to assess the uncertainty to the initial conditions in the ocean and vegetation states, different scenarios. Uh, different model configurations, which may mean either different models and or uh, different configurations of the same models. Try to get as many feedback processes as possible, carbon processes, uh, aerosol processes, and so on. And then if you're using regionalization techniques to really try to get a handle of the uncertainty associated with that by using different models, different techniques, and so on. And this is sort of the approach, in fact, that is being used now in the ensemble, in the European Ensembles project. And as I was saying, this is especially important at the regional scales. And if you're interested in changes in hydrologic variables, you, you have seen that the temperature pretty much, uh, you know, it's not so much of a problem. It's pretty smooth, uh, it doesn't change very much. But when you actually look at precipitation and the hydrologic cycle, everything becomes more nonlinear, more variable, and more difficult to do. So let me just propose at the end, I mean, if I had, 
not infinite resources, but uh, large resources. And uh, somebody asked me, okay, how do you want to print the climate prediction uh, problem? Can you suggest as a strategy? Um, there's, there are really, I think, two lines of thought. Um, we want regional information. To have regional information, we need uh, uh, um, high resolution. At the same time, if we want to cover the phase space, we need many simulations. Now, these two things don't go along together very well because you want many simulations, but if you want high resolution. High resolution is costly, many simulation is costly, but I'm given only $3 billion to do this. Well, I wish I was given $3 billion. But uh, uh, so I have to make a choice. Uh, and there are two schools of thought. Uh, one school of thought is that, is, uh, which is the one that I prefer, is, um, is described here. Um, I think to me it's more important to use a couple models at a sort of intermediate resolution, say one to two degrees, which is intermediate in the sense between regional and global, but it's really fairly high resolution when we are actually talking about couple models. This is present day state of the art couple models. And use these models to do as many simulations we can, uh, you know, with different models, different configurations, different scenarios, different initial conditions, and so on. So try to cover the phase space with the global model as well as possible. Then let's say we have, if you're lucky, hundreds of these simulations. We cannot, and we want to have regional information. I do think that we do have regionalization techniques that work well. They can sort of downscale, be they regional climate models or statistical downscaling. But of course, we cannot apply uh, different techniques to all of these hundreds or thousands of simulations that we produce with the intermediate resolution model. So at that point, we need to make a choice of uh, where do we apply uh, these regionalization techniques. So perhaps what can be done is to look at this large ensemble of simulations, look at the climate change we're interested in, let's say over Europe, and maybe come up with some sort of clustering of these, uh, of these, uh, um, of these simulations in terms of uh, some characteristic indicators. Um, for example, the, the figure that I've shown where you saw all these different, you know, the four clusters, A, B, C, D, do tell us, do suggest that climate uh, like to cluster. I mean, they, they, it's not just a gray, it's not just a sort of a gray spectrum. So I think there's some, uh, some hope that we can find these characteristic sort of climate change uh, regimes. And then once, uh, once we find those, we can, we can apply all these regionalization techniques. Now this is, uh, a, again, as I said, there's a different line of thought, which uh, mostly used, for example, at the, uh, at the, um, er, the Japanese community with the Earth Simulator, uh, in which uh, they actually decided to go with having very high resolution and very expensive global models, but do fewer simulations. So um, my own personal preference is for, is for this approach. And I think this is it. Thank you very much.